Hi, everybody. I promise you I will touch on that. Does everybody know Dr. Blitz? Hi, all who I haven't met or met. Who, who was here last year? Almost all of them. Almost all. Okay. <coughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> the, um, I think this is very interesting and timely and ties very well what Joe spoke about to what I'm going to discuss. Uh, the important thing is, uh, uh, one more comment about Joe's is this bundling concept. Bundling is not the bundling we've known, right? Bundling as it is to come is going to be a lot more all-encompassing. And this is where you guys got to be very careful and think ahead of the curve about what, how you're going to deal with it. Because what is, who, who can tell me what bundling is as it is envisioned in the ACA? The new? Yeah. Won't it include everything, including the surgeon's fees? It will include everything in the episode of care. So what that means, it's not completely delineated, but probably the money is going to funnel into the hospital first. And what it means is for right now, right, as cardiac surgery is, is done, the surgeons bill CPT codes for their fee. The hospital does, let's say, DRG. And those are all separately billed for. They're not combined. And each consult that comes, if I have a patient in renal failure, nephrologist who comes, bills on his own, all the consults on their own. This is going to be all-encompassing. So the government is going to give you one payment and it's going to tell the hospital you split it amongst everybody. So no longer can a nephrologist bill on his own. No longer can the surgeon bill on their own. So it's an interesting thing to think about how you guys are going to maintain your, your power when that comes along. Because this is all, to be cynical about it, it's all meant to disempower a, a lot of the healthcare professionals, and the balance is going to shift towards the hospitals much more than it is even now. Okay. And you, yes? It would be a decision maker on how that's split. You know? That's the key thing, and that's why I'm, I'm mentioning it here as the things to come, because ultimately it'll probably be the hospital. You know, the, the uh, ACOs, the centers, the cost centers. Uh, you know, uh, you, you guys probably all were aware that this year was the year to roll out cardiovascular care was going to be all bundled and then they decided to hold off because there were a lot of problems that came up but that's only been delayed and right now of course ACA and what's going to happen is very much in question but if bundling true bundling comes along you just want to think about how you're going to alter your business model or think ahead of the curve how you're going to represent yourself because you can you imagine there's going to be one pot of money and everybody's going to be going for a power grab much more so than they do now. Before, if you work in private practice hospitals, right, uh, I'm not going to mention names or what have you, but you, some of you know, uh, some places they'll consult everybody under the sun and everybody shares in that little lucrative game, right? You co consult A, B, critical care, co nephrology, da, 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 da. Everybody bills. And that, that's part of the problem of, of cost containment of health care because there's nothing limiting that. If I'm a cardiac surgeon, doesn't limit me one bit to call 15 consults. Doesn't impact my income, but it does I impact the costs. That's why the bundling concept came into play. Hasn't that already started with um, joint replacement? Yes, orthopedic procedures were the first pilot. How's that? So far, so good. They picked wisely because orthopedics isn't as, uh, uh, as, as complex and as labor intensive. And I think, I'm not sure because I'm not privy to all the discussions, but something bothered them about conceptually rolling out the, uh, the, uh, on the cardiovascular portion, all right? But yes, orthopedic was the pilot program. Yes? Is, is part of all of this uh, a, I have a nothing. play to make all doctors employees of the hospital? So it all depends on where you are in the political spectrum. But, I mean, one thought is, you know, are we going to make everybody employees, too, or are we all going to end up with a single-payer program, ultimately? You know, this is all in the works and being divided. But yes, what's, what's going to end up having to, having to happen is a, a consequence of bundling has to be that the hospital will eventually employ everybody, or the healthcare systems, right? Won't even be hospitals anymore, because they're too small to, to manage their costs. 
what's going to be the wave of the future is the Cleveland Clinic systems, the, the Mayo Clinic systems where you have, how many hospitals do you guys have in your system now? Do you know, within Cleveland, let's say? You have Hillcrest, right? Yeah, Hillcrest, Fairview. Metro. Metro is now part of you? No, it's just the heart, just the perfusion and the surgeons still. Um, so I don't know if you count that. And then in campus, Akron, they now have Akron. And they're all having to do that because they, it, it, it helps them with their costs and it helps them with their, obviously, the capture of the market. Then the, then the tertiary referral, quaternary referral center stays as the complex place and all the other places doing the less complex. I won't, uh, Joe's giving me the, the evil eye, so I'm not gonna go too much into it. But just think about those things coming ahead because that's ahead for you guys. Um, today, Joe honored me with uh, giving me, I don't know how many hours of talks, but we're gonna make it brisk. Please feel free to interrupt, ask questions. Uh, who's been here before? No, I don't mind. Uh, we're going to basically give three interrelated talks, uh, and they're all going to tie into each other. We're going to weave back and forth. All right, if you have any questions along the way, I'll be happy. And this is really going to be, in the two hours or so that I'm going to talk, it's going to be soup to nuts. It's going to be you as a perfusionist, what you should know about the law, how will it impact you, and how might you profit from it. All right? So essentially, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background in law in terms of what you should know, that's going to impact how you protect yourselves. Now, I'm going to touch on, but I'm not going to dwell too much on how you should practice perfusion because you guys could teach me that, okay? What, you guys have your guidelines, you have everything else in front of you, but I'm going to teach you how, with an understanding of the law, you can have an appreciation of where you might err or where you can get into trouble because we all make mistakes. Okay, when is the mistake something that's going to expose you to liability? And when is a mistake an ordinary course of events? Okay, it's little, big. And finally, for those who want to venture, I want to tell you a little bit about how to be an expert witness and kind of dispel some of the uh, aura that surrounds expert witnesses because I think that field needs some good people. All right, and I will talk about that at the end. By the way, I did bring for anyone, I have no affiliation with this company, but it's a company that from, who publishes books that I learned from on all the aspects of becoming an expert witness. You know, they have, I've never gone to any of their conferences, but the books are very good. They're probably the best that I've seen in terms of how you incorporate that to your practice. Uh, because I know perfusionists are, are uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, no, well, bes <laughs> besides that, very entrepreneurial. Right? You guys are among the most entrepreneurial people I've ever met. You know, always thinking about how to make better business model for yourself. This is another thing to, to add to the mixture. Okay? And we'll talk about all those things. So the goals of today is going to be to describe the different causes of action for malpractice litigation. As particularly how it, how it, it impacts you as perfusionists. And the discussion about the employment model versus independent contractor model is very germane here and you need to understand that because it will affect you. Uh, I'm going to show what are the mechanics of a lawsuit. What does the plaintiff, the patient suing, what do they need to show and how do they need to show it? How can you protect and defend yourself and how can you can provide expert services? In terms of the law and how it impacts you, there's a variety of areas. You are the perfusionist in the center. We've got laws that are on the administrative level that are usually state-based, saying what you can and cannot do, can't impersonate a doctor, you can't make, make, pretend you're a perfusionist when you're not. Those are all very serious crimes. Those are administrative and regulatory. Then you get to the criminal stuff. Uh, if you do something <coughs> beyond what's usually adjudicated in civil law, assault, battery, uh, battery is actually a crime that you can commit against the patient if you, for instance, do a procedure you weren't supposed to do without consent. Okay. Contract also affects you guys. Some of these lawsuits between patients and doctors and med health care involve contracts, but this area is mostly in your employment relationships. I'm not going to dwell on that today, but if you have questions about contractual stuff, please feel free to ask at the end. I'm going to focus on this, torts, okay? 
Torts is the Norman word. It's derived from the Norman word for a wrongful act. Okay? Torts and contracts are what we call civil law. Criminal, civil law. Criminal, it's you against the government, a defendant. Contracts and torts, it's you against somebody else, another party. That one person is suing somebody else. Now, I'm not going to review them today, but many of the cases that I've reviewed, I've reviewed all the court cases that have made it to the appellate or Supreme Court uh, level that involve perfusionists. Some of them involved contractual disputes that were uh, pretty nasty. I'm not going to talk about those today, but today I'm going to focus on the malpractice issue because I think that's the most important. But that's your general perspective of where things lie. History of malpractice all the way back to Hammurabi. If the doctor has treated a gentleman with a lancet of bronze and has caused the gentleman to die or has opened an abscess of the eye for a gentleman with a bronze lancet and has caused the loss of the gentleman's eye, one shall cut off his hands. You know, so this is the Hammurabi Code. Uh, thankfully, it's a little less harsh nowadays. But that's where we go back to. Jump ahead to English law, 1615. You'll see a lot of terminology, even that we preserve to today, about servants and masters. You are all servants. I'm a servant in some respects, in the eyes of the law, all right? You're evolving, and I say this in the most benign sort of way, you're evolving to going to a master. That's not a good thing, okay? When you're a servant, you're kind of, your misdeeds get blamed on somebody else. When you're a master, you're accountable, okay? And that's the, the, the reason the terminology is important. Both the servant and his master can sue for damages against the doctor who had treated the servant and made him more ill by employing unwholesome medicine. So here we're talking about property rights. And a lot of the concepts in, in traditional common law are, are, have to do with property. The traditional definition of rape was that a husband couldn't rape his wife because his wife was his property. That was the common law that existed until this century. You know, that has changed, thankfully. But there's a lot of vestiges of common law that are still on the books. Where do we get our law in the United States? It's really complicated, I gotta tell you. Well, sure. The law of the land is the Constitution. That takes primacy over everything else. Following that are actual laws passed by Congress, and followed that is common law. Common law is where we had to start with. It's all the prior decisions of the courts in additive fashion. So if you had a, a case in front of you as a judge that you were trying to decide, you would look to the prior cases of your jurisdiction to determine what the law is. And you couldn't deviate from that. If your Supreme or Appellate Court made a decision saying in this particular type of instance, if A does this to B, you need B should be found guilty for these reasons or whatever. So those were the vestiges of it. The common law is still very much present and really defines most of what we know about torts today. Criminal law is mostly by statutes nowadays. And we have the variety of levels. So we have the primacy of the Constitution. Now you hear with all the stuff that's going on in politics about how the states' rights and, the, and et cetera, that derives from the fact that if the powers are not enumerated in the Constitution, all the rest of the law is the domain of the states. All right, and that's where a lot of conflicts arise. Most of what we're going to focus on here, if you are involved in a malpractice claim, it's gonna be the laws that are state court common law. What happens during a lawsuit, okay? First thing you do is the, the plaintiff's lawyer is going to file a complaint. Files a complaint with the jurisdiction and the person who's being sued gets a copy of that complaint. The complaint has a whole bunch of items. If you ever saw, saw one of these, you know, you, you think the person was Hitler. I mean, they, they put everything possible that you could possibly be accused of. They assume that you've done everything wrong. 
everything else gets sorted out later. But it starts with a whole bunch of different complaints or what we call cause of action. The reasons that they're suing you. You didn't do this, you didn't do this, or you were supposed to do this and you didn't do that. Okay? Within 30 days, the defendant has to respond with some answers to this to the court about why, the, why they did it or, or, or why it isn't the case. And anywhere along this map, things can stop. Either the plaintiff drops the case because the lawyer decides it's not worth his expense, or the, 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 a, a, um, an agreement is reached with a settlement at some point. And so this is a big Game of Thrones going through this process. Everybody decides, it's, it's, it really is like chess. Who's got more power at each part? And it modifies the power between the plaintiff and the defense. And that's where experts play a huge, huge role. Okay? Goes to this, after the answers are given, if the case is moving forward, there's a discovery period. Discovery period is where each side, it's like, uh, you show me, I'll show you. Uh, they do interrogatories. Side A says, okay, why did you do this? Why did you do that? What did you do this? Did you do that? And then the other side has to answer and they go back and forth. Medical records are obtained and expert witnesses are called. When would you be involved? Anything that involves perfusion or ECMO. That's your scope of practice. Perfusionists weren't heavy, heavily involved decades ago in these because you had relatively, you had relative non-standing, okay, at that point, because, again, you were an employee, you were answerable either to the surgeon or to the hospital. That's very different now. But as things got more complex, and as you know, in truth, how little cardiac surgeons know about what you do at the pump, perfusionists have become very important uh, expert witnesses, all right, in, in terms of explaining what it is that went wrong with the case, whether there's any kind of case to be made for it. Um, so the expert witness makes a review. Then after that stage, if the court case is still going on, there's depositions where you basically sit in front of, of a, a court stenographer and the opposing counsel asks you questions and basically interrogates you as a deposition. We're still not at court yet. Everybody's trying to figure out what kind of case they have. If they're still in dispute and no settlement has been reached, they try to go through alternative dispute resolution because it's quicker, more efficient, and less costly. But if the two sides are still buttonheaded, finally you make it to trial. Okay? I will give you my philosophy. I will also tell you why uh, expert witnesses have gotten a bad name over the years. All right? And why it's a difficult position. It's not for everybody. Okay? As perfusionists, you have to have hard skin to begin with because you're dealing with us all day long. Okay? But this requires especially hard skin, especially if you stick to your guns and you do the right thing. And I'll show you how to do that. But your role is not to win for your side. You gotta remember that. Your role is to tell the truth. Your role is to be honest and unbiased. All right? The question is, if you're told uh, this happened during a case, let's say, uh, uh, a, a bubble of air got to the patient on the arterial side and the patient stroked. And you're going to be asked, I need you to review a case, tell me if this is something that is negligent or not. I'm going to show you today how you figure that out. Okay? Because it's not easy, it's not straightforward. We are all used to science. We're all used to as close to 100% certainty as you can possibly come. This is a whole other domain. A lot of gray areas. And that's why the expert's very important, okay? But you can't just be an expert. You've got to be an expert who can communicate. Communicate well with the lawyer and communicate well with, the, with the, uh, the jury so they understand what's going on. But your role is defined. I, most of my work that I've done is for the defense. It's what I prefer. But occasionally I'll do plaintiff's work. I would say 75% of the time that I get a plaintiff, that is, you know, a patient is suing a doctor, 75% of the time, I tell them they have no case. And that's my role. Most cases, truth be told, are not with merit. Okay? And I would rather have someone like me there who's standing for objectivity rather than someone who's going to be a hired gun. 
And that's what I mean why the, we need to have good people in there. And the lawyers actually respect that. If you're called by an attorney for a plaintiff to give your opinion, and you say, you know what, uh, I'm sorry, but you do not have a case for X, Y, Z reasons. They appreciate that. Why do they appreciate that? Time and money. Who, how are plaintiff's lawyers usually paid? That's most of the time. But if you're a plaintiff's case in malpractice, how are they paid? Contingency. Contingency. Okay. They don't get paid unless they win as far as the, the patient is concerned. So everything up front while they're evaluating is an expense for them. So the earlier it is in the process, the cheaper it is. But as you get further and further, the court has to, the, the attorney has to pay lots of money. So you, you do your review, you charge however much, and you say you don't have a case. I found them actually very appreciative of that because they don't want to waste money. Right? You can make money two ways. You can have, have a true revenue that has less cost and you've done a good deal. Or you can have, if, the, if there's no revenue, you minimize the, co the cost that you're spending. That's the bottom line. All right. Do me a favor. Let me know when we get to the time because I can stop the, this any time along the way and we'll just continue with the, the other lectures. You know what I'm okay. saying? Just let me know. So cause of action is that reason why they're suing you. One of those things they put on the claim. Each cause of action is listed in that complaint. The plaintiff has the burden of proof, and that's very important. We all watch crime shows. We know innocent until proven guilty. What is the criterion by which we can judge in criminal cases? So someone is accused of murder. What does the, uh, the government have to prove? By what level of evidence? You've all heard on TV shows. Beyond a reasonable doubt beyond unreasonable doubt. <laughs> so that is the highest, meaning criminal is going to be the, be the, the worst consequences for the defendant. So you want to have the highest proof. You'd rather risk letting people go free than risk sending an innocent to jail. So it requires the highest, okay? Civil is less, okay? Civil is by the preponderance of the evidence, which means greater than 50% likelihood that it's true. Now think about that. We're used to reading studies and saying something's not proven unless the, the likelihood of it being a, 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 a true event is less than 0, .0 you know, a, a false event is less than 0 .05. Here we're saying, boy, if the jury thinks that it's 51% true, it doesn't matter. <laughs> It doesn't matter whether they're 51% or 99%. I'll buy that thing. So that, that's why it's very important the utility you provide, the expert provides, because the jury is listening to you. Okay, and your ability to communicate to them is going to be utmost. If you sit up there pontificating and talk about things that they have no idea about, you've served no purpose, no matter how right you are. All right? But they have the burden of the proof, and it's by the preponderance of the evidence. And they've got, to prove, they've got to prove each element of the claim. So in law, any law that's a sentence, for instance, uh, the crime of assault is intentionally causing in the, def in the plaintiff apprehension that you're going to commit a battery against them. Each of those elements, intention is an element, uh, causing the plaintiff is another element, uh, apprehension is another element, and impending battery is another element. Each of those aspects need to be proven. So it's not like they have to prove the whole thing. Every single one of them has to be beyond 50% or else they lose the case. So when you start in a court case, the defendant is in a superior position. Okay? The defendant is like the house in blackjack. Okay? <laughs> the other side has got to count cards or do other things to get beyond it. All right? And I've already spoken about these different causes of action. Me, sure. Going back to the expert, he's paid. You, you 
cannot do that. Ethically, you cannot do that. You get paid regardless of the outcome. You get paid the same regardless of the outcome. <laughs> Correct. So you can't. So if any attorneys won't do that because they know that right off the bat. But you, what, you, what you do, and I'll show you a little bit about the economic side towards the tail end of when I'm speaking, but a variety of ways if you can charge. The way it makes a difference to your outcome is when I tell a plaintiff's attorney that I don't think they have a case, my, in case, my income is much less, right? So there's bias. There's bias there, and you've got to fight that bias, right? There are, mo there are other things intimidating you because none of us wants to go up against our peer when there wasn't very strong grounds for doing that, right? So that's, that's something that, that's a mitigator for you. But when I tell someone he doesn't have a case, I hurt my income because I'm not getting paid per hour anymore for reviewing the case. But that's the only way it makes a difference. Can't do it by outcome. So I was very confused when I started my law studies. I didn't really understand what the judge did as opposed to the jury. Okay, they're very different roles and they sometimes get confused. The judge's role, besides running the, the, the decorum in the court, is to explain the law to the jury. A jury can't come in and hear the evidence and then all of a sudden decide if someone's guilty of murder or not. The judge has to explain to them what the law is, what's required, telling them about the level of evidence that's required, and explains the law during the course of the case and before they take a vote about what the law means. That is his most important role. The jury is the trier of fact. Jury listens to all the evidence and decides what's true and what's not of the facts. They're the ones who listen to both sides and say, this is what I think more than likely happened. That's the role of the jury. Do you understand the difference? Okay. He's the law, they're the facts. It's the interaction of law and facts. Sometimes, and that's what this arrow is for, some cases are just by judge. It's a bench trial. Uh, sometimes the plaintiff wants to be in front of a judge rather than a jury because the, the subject matter is very technical. And they feel it would be, it'll be difficult enough to teach a judge about what it is about as opposed to a jury, right? So then the judge becomes both. There are other checks and balances. If the jury, if the judge thinks the jury is egregious, he may override that, them. But that's a rarity. Okay? We talked about standard of, of, of proof before. So scientific medical, the level of evidence has to be four star. Near certainty. Okay? Criminal, beyond a reasonable doubt. Civil, clear and convincing or beyond with a preponderance of the evidence. Those are the same exact terms, more likely than not, similarly, and then regulatory precautionary principle, which I don't even know what that is, but it's, it's of lesser evidence. Those are just ad advisements, in other words. So we are now moving into the sphere of a suit. All right, I'm going to outline to you what happens. Litigation, we have two different types of suits, tort or contractual. We're going to discuss a little bit of all of these, but spend most of our time on negligence, which is really where 95% plus of suits are based on. Okay, so litigation is just a lawsuit. A claim is a lawsuit. They're all similar terms. As an aside, I'm going to start off by giving you a contract case just in passing because it's, this is a contract case that every law student loves and knows. You hear the most absurd things when you re review trials. So this is actually contract involving medicine. So a contract, for your background, this is the definition, the legal definition of what a contract is. An agreement with specific terms. And by the way, this is what I mean by um, elements. An agreement is one element. With specific terms, another one. Between two or more persons. Or, and the reason why I say them separately is they each have their own meaning that has to be interpreted, and they each have to be proven. So there are two or more entities in which there is a promise to do something in return for a valuable benefit known as consideration. Consideration is what you get back from doing your end of the promise. Sometimes it's a promise by the other person. Sometimes my promise is to give you my car if you pay me $5,000. Okay, The $5,000 is the consideration on my end. 
The other guy's consi consideration is the car. You understand? So this is one of the early cases of contract law involving medicine. Hawkins v. McGee, back from 1929. That was a good year, wasn't it? <laughs> Surgeon McGee promised to replace scar tissue on Hawkins' hand and told Hawkins he would give him a 100% good hand. Skin was grafted from the patient's chest and patient grew a very hairy palm, which was not just hairy, but it was very dysfunctional. In the end, he was awarded $500. This case is on the record books because there's other reasons that are technical that are not important for our discussion today. But this has been known by the law students as the infamous Harry Palm case. You ask anybody who's a lawyer, they'll know, they'll know this case. But it's one of the lesser common ways of having a dispute between a patient and a doctor. It's contractual. Now we're going to move into the, the torts, which is the bulk of what we're going to talk about. So it, it, a tort is a civil wrong for which a remedy may be obtained, usually in the form of damages. It's from the Norman word for wrong, like I told you, and there are three types of torts. Negligence, intentional, and strict liability. I'm going to talk a little bit about what each of these are and how it impacts you, but we're going to spend most of our time on the negligence, all right? But it's basically a wrong. What they're coming to civil court for is for payment. They want damages. You have wronged them, they allege, and what they want to do is be paid on a variety of different indicators of damages. Okay, and that's what's going on in tort lawsuits. Okay, negligence. This is very important. This is the legal definition of negligence as it defines to you every common person, a guy walking on the street. The failure to exercise the standard of care that a reasonably prudent person would have exercised in a similar situation. This is the basis for lawsuits among people who uh, have interactions in the street or at work and they're suing somebody. The judgment is, did you do something that fell below what a reasonably prudent person would have done? So there's this thing called a standard of care. And lawyers talk about it as if there's something real about it. There really isn't. It's a figment of the imagination. It's, it's a, a, an imaginary guide of what a person should and shouldn't do. Okay? So would, in other words, would a reasonable person have done this in response to that or for whatever reasons? So he's a hypothetical person who exercised the degree of attention, knowledge, intelligence, and judgment that society requires of its members for the protection of their own and of others' interest. All right, and this is going to relate to your, your defense for any wrongs because what they're going to look at is not the standard of care of a reasonably prudent person, but a reasonably prudent perfusionist. Okay, that's how it changes for you, but that's the, that's the criterion. <laughs> Malpractice is just an instance of negligence that occurs on the part of a professional. We all think it's medical, but there's legal malpractice, there's political malpractice, there's all sorts of malpractices, but the predominant one is obviously medical. And here it is, just to, to, to lend the last definition, a doctor's failure to exercise the degree of care and skill that a physician or surgeon of the same medical specialty would use under similar circumstances. And this, is the, this is what the expert is telling them. The court doesn't know. The court has no way of knowing. That's why they need experts. If somebody punches you, you get into a fight in a bar, and it's not a criminal case, you're suing that person. You don't need a specialist to, to, to help you adjudicate that situation. That's common man. But this is area of higher intellectual knowledge Specialization, you require the specialist to tell the court. Now there's degrees of fault that are important here, and I'm going to show you how this relates in this one slide. And by the way, if anybody wants the slides, I can send it to you in PDF, uh, just email me, or LinkedIn, I'm on, Joe has my email. Starting from the left, how bad were you? Okay? You didn't have any fault at all. 
If that you didn't have any fault, that means you're not guilty of any tort. Or if it's a strict liability crime, you could still be guilty of that. Strict liability are crimes that it doesn't matter what your intent or level of knowledge is. Most of them are misdemeanors. So for instance, you pull, get pulled over in a traffic stop or speeding, you're speeding. Cop pulls you over, doesn't matter what excuse you give him. All he needs to know is that you were speeding and he has the right to give you a ticket. It doesn't matter what your excuse. If, he, if, you were, if your wife is on the way to the hospital to deliver, he can still give you a ticket. Now most won't, but that is considered strict liability crimes. And why they're made strict liability is in the interests of fairness to everybody, not to spend a whole bunch of money in courts, there are certain things that they feel should be strict liability to make it more efficient. So for instance, most devices, right? If a heart-lung machine goes down, I'm just using you by convenience, but if a heart-lung machine goes down and there's something defective about the device, that's strict liability. All right, they don't go into the hows and what's. If the device fails from, uh, and we're gonna go into the way devices can fail, but that's strict liability. So beyond that, you go into negligence, which is the main thrust. And when you're negligent, the patient gets damages. If you're worse, if you're grossly negligent, that's being really negligent, okay? You've done something that you know you shouldn't have done and you do it, ordinary plus punitive damages. The damages are because you did something bad, so because we're punishing you, patient's gonna benefit from that. And finally is this bad stuff, willful, wanton, reckless content. That puts you in the criminals, so you're, you're liable for criminal offenses, and you have punitive damages and other things beyond that. So those are your degree of fault. The vast majority of anything that a surgeon does or a perfusion does falls into this. That's 99%. And I'll give you an example of what the differences are because it's hard to tell conceptually. So let's say you're on a residential street and you're going 20 miles per hour and you hit a child. Child darts out from between two cars and you hit and kill a child. This is the law. If you were driving the speed limit and were very careful and attentive, and who decides that? The jury, the trier of fact, decides whether you are listening to the evidence of both sides. You are not guilty, okay? Because you did not do anything wrong. This was a bad thing that happened, but it happened due to no fault of your own. Same thing holds true for some perfusion accidents, right? 30 miles per hour. So now you're going 10 above the speed limit and you hit the child and kill. That, many people do that, right? It's not that uncommon. That is probably gonna move you into the negligent sphere. 50 miles per hour, now you're grossly negligent. And finally, let's say 75, willful wanton. That's the, w that's the way you kind of tell degrees. Obviously, you can't put numbers to this, but just conceptually, that's the image I'm trying to, th this is all determined by a jury. The judge tells them what each of these terms mean. And the jury decides whether the facts fit into which one of these areas. This is just showing that when we talk about negligence, we talked a little bit about this, the general public man. Medical negligence is the GP. The general doctor is held by one criterion and the specialist is held to the much higher one the standard of care because he knows better, all right? If, a medic, if, if the GP makes a mistake, all right, it might be tolerated if only the specialist would know not to. However, his mistake may have been not to refer a specialist, right? But th this, this is the degree. As you get more specialized, you're held to a higher standard, obviously. Smothers versus Hanks occurred in 1872 and here we're starting to get into the area of how do we decide, and this is very relevant to you, what the standard of care is. How do you know if you've done something, whether you have committed malpractice? Now we're gonna to try to define malpractice so that people kind of understand what it is. Here, this suit, the law requires of physicians and surgeons the exercise of average professional skill, the improvements and advanced stage of the profession at the time of treatment not being lost sight of. 
And a dissenting judge said, held that exercise of the skill of the thoroughly educated physician is required. What this all means is, they're holding the surgeon and the other medical practitioner to a higher standard. Average is, I think, what causes the most confusion amongst people. Because what is an average surgeon? What is an average perfusionist? And this, this was a case about someone, it was actually an adult, but the orthopedic surgeon did uh, some kind of procedure on the legs and they ended up being grossly abnormal in length. The question was not whether the doctor had skill enough to make the leg as straight and as long as the other, but whether he had employed such reasonable skill and diligence as are ordinarily exercised in his profession. For less than this, he is responsible for damages. So there's a cutoff, and this cutoff if you make it above the cutoff, you're okay. If you fall below it, you're accountable. And that defines your standard of care. This is something that I made up to just kind of give you this because this is really important that probably 90% of the people that do expert witnessing or that try to understand what it means to fall below the standard of care. So I wanna ask you, Suppose you're analyzing 10,000 operations, 100 perfusions that each did 100 cases, okay? And some objective, unbiased, all-knowing perfusionist is grading each of the maneuvers. So we're talking about, so it's not really you have 10,000 bits of data. You're now breaking up each operation to going on bypass, cooling, warming, any way you want to arbitrarily define it and someone is grading you, and this is all the data he gets pooled from everybody, which comes out to a bell curve, as you would expect. So, <clears throat> tell me of A, B, C, and D, where do you think we should draw the line of what the standard of care is, below which you are negligent? Who says A? So A is the mean. So anybody who's left of A would be negligent? So A is here, B is here, C is here, D is here. So I'm asking if you had to look at all these events, which are events that fell below the standard of care? So Which let me hold on. Four outcomes on, on the ones C and D. Okay, so I'm going to take a, a, a little vote and then we'll talk about it. Who thinks it's A? Average. So, average. so a, a is is 50. Let's say you're grading on a scale of one to ten. If you get below five on any of the things that you've done, are you negligent? Where are you negligent? So nobody says A, right? Good. B. Okay, so about a third of you say B. How about C? Okay, and D? Interesting. Okay, this is why we need good people. It's D. All right? I'm going to give you what I'm calling these areas because this is very important, and most people don't learn it this way. After struggling for hours with this, I came up with this representation because I think it's the easiest way to understand where things are. <clears throat> in, right, this is just a mean and we're talking about st really standard deviations over here. One, two, three, four standard deviations. Really, if you said B, you're saying that 16% of maneuvers that you do as perfusionists are negligent, okay? What it is, is what is in this category are things, are different ways people do things but are equivalent. So the middle area is where they're different. Alter Tell me something in perfusion that you guys do, clamping or whatever, that, that people have different ways of doing it. That may irritate the shit out of you, but it's another way of doing it that's equally valid. Wrap or don't wrap. Okay. Wrap or don't wrap. Now that's not a very good example because that's it's not your well it's not your decision you know altogether but let's say it was 
okay? Whether you, the surgeon leaves it completely up to you and wrap or don't wrap. So if you have a case someone did well is volume overloaded afterwards and dies of pulmonary edema, and you're a wrapper, and they didn't wrap, are they negligent? That's this middle area. Now, let's just say that those are comparable. I know that half of you are going to argue about one is better than the other. This sphere is where it's less favorable alternative, but still within the standard of care. So let's say we have excellent evidence that using transcranial Doppler reduces stroke. And you had a patient that stroked. You had some low flow during the, the pump period. And I'm not going about who's to blame, right? This is surgeon. We're all just thinking about that as, an, as one entity, OK? And you didn't use transcranial Doppler. The patient had a low flow period. And you didn't use somanetics either or, or whatever one you like to use in terms of cerebral oximetry. The patient had a stroke afterwards. Are they negligent? Any of you not use somanetics? I, mean, I don't mean somanetics, but just cerebral oximetry. No. And it's, it, people, different people say the standard of care is defined by guidelines in addition to the, the practice. Okay, so it's not just decided by the guidelines themselves, but because there's lots of variation. Guidelines, right, are not uh, things you have to strictly adhere to. So they're not the same thing as standard of care. But, so if he puts somebody on bypass and the guy has a stroke afterwards, and someone's saying, oh, look, the perfusion pressure was only 40 for 10 minutes or whatever, is he culpable because, and that obviously happens on, on, not infrequently, he is not culpable for not using cerebral oximetry. Although, perhaps it's better to have that. Perhaps, let's just say it is, just for the sake of argument. That would fall into this area, okay? Something that, and, and hospitals may decide not to use things because of costs, right? This is very important because think about what's gonna happen to all this as the hospital is forcing you to meet budget, okay? And you have things that improve patient care, but you know very well, as well as I do, the big fallacy about saving money is the hospital doesn't look at it in the future, it looks at it at the present this particular patient. They don't look at it and say, hey, you saved, uh, we look at all these patients, since we introduced cerebral oximetry, our stroke rate has, got, has halved. You know, that's, that's not the way of thinking. Usually it's what this patient cost us by his egregious length of stay or what have you, or all the equipment. All the toys. All the toys. Dr. Blitz uses transcranial Doppler, cerebral oximetry, uh, measures graph flow, uh, those are all expensive and very hard to move. You can bring studies to them, but I don't know if ever you, you've brought studies to administrators that kind of look at you and like this, right? So that's just an aside to think about as we're getting more and more pressed for cost control. What's going to happen to some of these standards? Because I'll give you a parallel example. This is you to appreciate this. Police, police. Let's say you live in Houston, very high crime area. You, uh, you're a woman alone with your children at home, 3 a.m. Someone's knocking on the door. You can't see who it is. They won't tell you. You're scared. Your husband's been meaning to take you to the range, but hasn't yet. And you call the police. Police take... 45 minutes to show up. Can you sue for that? If someone broke in and harmed your wife or your child or this, and the police took 45 minutes, could you sue? You could sue, but you probably wouldn't win because that's a policy decision on the, on the part of the government. The government decides how many policemen they're going to have and how many they're going to pay for. All right? And if it's, if it's a policy issue about how much you're going to pay 
to, to, for how many people, as long as it's not egregious, they're within the policy making, and those things are usually protected if it's the government, because otherwise they'd be sued right and left. Many of decisions that are made by courts and the way law works are very counterintuitive to what you would do and what you would say. That's another thing to remember. So what I'm saying here is the same thing. If a, policy, a hospital decides Medicare is only giving us, they've decided they're only going to pay us 20000 per cabbage. And that's a loser, even, even if you, things stream straight through, right? What are you going to do? So all of a sudden, the hospital's going to look at all the different equipment. What, what can you do without? Hey, Joe, you don't need that arterial filter. <clears throat> things to think about, because this is, this is going to be a problem. But that's in here, this gray area where people decide to do without things that are probably of benefit, but still people do it. And that's what defines standard, all right? If there, are, if there are a significant number of people, and I can't give you a number that a percentage that's significant, that would say they do it, then it falls within the standard of care. It doesn't mean, matter that it's different from the way you think it should be done or the way you practice. Down here, I wouldn't do it. I would never do that. But occasional people do it. And you don't see anything that's particularly harmful about doing something a certain way. But you just think it's a waste of time and money. Measuring graph flows. The, the graph flow meter is expensive. It's expensive on a per case basis or whether you divide. But I, I use it religiously. I think it's very important to know before you leave the OR whether your graphs are open, how good the flow is, and how it correlates with what you saw in the operating room. And it's helpful later on so that if, if there's a problem with the graft or ischemia in a certain territory, you can make a good decision about whether the patient has to go to the cath lab, back to the OR, et cetera. Of you guys here, who, whose surgeons measure graft flow in the OR? Good, but about half. And half don't. I happen to believe religiously that it's very important. But if I'm asked to evaluate a case where he didn't and the graft went down, and the patient didn't have time for a decision. The patient had a cardiac arrest, and the autopsy showed that a certain graft was down. All right, and perhaps the, a, a measuring graft flow in the OR might have told us differently. This area. This is clear negligence. You've got to be clear about it. This is where experts do the most harm to the profession. A lot of them think it's here, intuitively. Many think it's here. That's kind of where average falls. And this nomenclature, you've got to forget the terms that are used by the courts because they know nothing about what we do. So conceptually, this is really something nobody would do. It's not an average perfusionist. It's the minimally competent perfusionist. The minimum you expect from somebody who practiced perfusion Five minutes? Okay. We'll wrap this part up. So nobody would do this part, okay? It's never clear, and cu clear cut. But what I'm trying to explain to you is where things fall. Remember that stuff about standard and science and why? This is the main reason why scientists, we're all scientists, why scientists can't communicate with lawyers. We have a very difficult time. This is something to learn. It's something to learn. Mistakes happen. So the role of the expert witness is often required in malpractice suits to prove one or more element of a cause of action. After the break, I'm going to talk about these different causes of, of, of elements of, uh, of negligence. First thing is duty, is whether you owed a duty to the patient. Clearly you did. They're undergoing heart surgery. This is pretty much not an issue, OK? Questionable cases arise if, let's say, you're a Joe perfusionist. You're walking in the hallway, and a patient, not yours, has a cardiac arrest on the floor. Do you have a duty to do CPR if you know? Of course. Do you have a duty? Yeah. Everybody? What if the patient's outside in the street? Yes. You're in the mall. You have a duty? Absolutely. Yeah. No. Not at all. American law, 
rests on the principle that in the vast majority of cases you do not have a duty. You're sitting on the beach on a beach chair. Yes. What if you're certified as a PLS provider? Nope. No obligation. Nope. You said that you would do and you didn't do it? Nothing. You do nothing. I'm going to give you an even better example. This is a classic example in law school. In the hospital, you probably have a duty. And you notice I use terms like probably, right? Because a jury decides that. But out of the hospital, you don't have a duty. You don't have a duty. American custom and law is we want to appreciate when somebody does things out of goodwill. We don't want to mandate it. Plus, we know the courts would be flooded. We've got to think about efficiency. If you are, and this is a horrible example every law student gets. You're sitting on a beach, lounging on a beautiful summer day on a beach chair. A little two-year-old runs by, don't see the parents anywhere. Jumps in the water, goes down, and is drowning. Literally, two feet away from you. You don't say, ah, I'd rather listen to my music and read my iPad. Did you do something wrong? No, you didn't. E e ethically, you did. Ethically, you did. But I'm trying to teach you the difference between morally and legally. Our culture and legal system is based on the lack of a duty unless you're given one. Now, a parent whose child is there drowning, parent has a duty. A guardian has a duty. A lifeguard has a duty because that's a contractual duty. Uh, a daycare provider has a duty. But most, New York subway, I see these videos all, I come from New York so I can say it. Somebody, somebody takes videos, I, I couldn't believe it, I saw it last night on Facebook. Somebody, a crowded subway, elderly black man is being beat up by a black youth and robbing him, beating the hell out of him. And in the video I see the feet of all the people sitting around and nobody does a single thing. But nobody did anything wrong, legally, okay? So, <laughs> that's the duty. But if you're a doctor or you're a perfusionist and you're doing a case, you have a duty to that patient. Regardless, there's no even ifs, ands, or, or buts. So that's a given. What you're being called, and damages, you don't determine because you have no idea. An economist determines the damages. How much money, if, if, if a patient died as a result of something you did, how much is owed to the family is dependent on a bunch of things that's not within your scope of practice. These two things are. Did the perfusionist go below the standard of care? Did he breach it? And did his breach cause the death of the patient? When we come back after the break, we're going to talk about those things and how you, how you demonstrate it. Perfect. Okay? Ten minutes and everybody be back.